The way that we're going to do this is we're going to go through five different areas uh, which are built out of a benchmark which we've created over the last four, uh, three or four months with the AEO. The format of today is that we're going to introduce the top elements of the benchmark first, the five elements, and just show you what you can expect. But then we're going to look at one by one. And the idea here is that this is as much as I talk on this webinar. The idea is that I hand over to these guys to give their experiences around best in class sales experiences and what they've been doing over the last year, what lessons they've learned, and really importantly, what they're doing moving forward to project confidence into their clients. So let me take you through what the benchmark looks like. And as a reminder, I mentioned it earlier, but this will be sent out to you following this session today by the AEO. So you'll get your own version of this benchmark. And I'd strongly recommend as we go through this today to be selfish in the sense of think about yourself. What can you use that you learn today off these panelists? Where are you against the benchmark that has been set and what are your strengths or your team strengths and what are the opportunities there use it to reflect and in the Q&A as Joe mentioned before put in questions as we go through be brave enough to put your name forward and say actually I want some ideas from these guys this is my situation what can I do and we will do everything we can at the end of the session today to answer those questions you put in so here we go So these are the five areas we're going to look at. These are the core titles of the benchmark, which are we're going to be looking at mindset. Quite obviously right now to be able to instill confidence into the client and the audience with exhibitions and events, we need to be in the right mindset ourselves. And we'll break that down in a minute to make sure that we're looking at how these guys have made sure their mindset is set to drive confidence into the industry and their clients. The next part of the benchmark is shifting perspective. So a massive part around being able to sell to anyone, whether it's events or outside of events, is being able to put yourself into the buyer's shoes or the audience's shoes and think what's going to make it tough for them to say yes and what's going to make it easier and making sure all of your approaches are built to make it easy for them to say yes. So we're going to hear how these guys have been doing that and what they've taken on board and what they're going to push moving forward in their careers in terms of events and their approaches to shift in perspective. We're then going to look at take control. So this is the idea that the customer or client isn't always right right now because so many things have changed in terms of the audience, in terms of the offering. And so there is an element of being able to lead them through that buying process. So again, we'll hear from these guys as to what they've done there. Collaboration. Collaboration is the idea that we're genuinely there to help our clients achieve their goals. So again, it's absolutely crucial right now in terms of driving trust into the industry and confidence in your clients and how they buy. So we're going to listen to opportunities, opportunities and ideas as to what these guys have done there. And the final one is projects confidence. So quite obviously, if you are someone who is projecting confidence to someone else, they are going to take an element of that confidence on themselves. So we're going to look at how, again, these guys have done that. So they're the five areas. We'll have a proper breakdown as we go through. We're going to start with the first one and get these guys chatting as quick as possible. So the first one we're going to look at, that's where my animation didn't work, is mindset. So three areas, I'll take you through them really quickly and then I'm going to jump to uh, one of these guys to chat about it. So um, mindset, this is absolutely crucial right now. Being in the right frame of mind, having the right attitude is absolutely critical to be able to drive confidence across the rest of your team, but also confidence across your clients, about the audience, about the future of the event, et cetera. So one piece in terms of mindset, there's three parts to each of these, is having a growth mindset. So a number of you may have read or um, seen uh, insights into the idea of growth and fixed mindset. Fixed mindset is someone who feels there's always a certain way of doing stuff. You can't learn, you can't get better, you're a natural salesperson or you're not. Growth mindset, which is far more impactful in terms of outputs right now based on all the research, is someone who prioritizes learning and always thinks I can do better. I can make a mistake, but I'll get better from it. So it's always about progressing and getting stronger and stronger in terms of skill set. Number two is a mindset which is optimistic. Again, there's far more um, chance of being a successful salesperson right now if there is optimism in the way you sell and the way you position things and talk to your clients about the situation. So being an optimistic salesperson is absolutely crucial. It doesn't mean not being realistic, but being optimistic as opposed to pessimistic is going to have a huge impact on the client. And the last one is all about well-being, which is an absolutely critical part right now in terms of event sales throughout leadership 
and in terms of event businesses and how you set your um, teams up to succeed. But being able as a salesperson to be resilient to all the pushbacks and tough conversations you have to have and looking after your own welfare is absolutely crucial. So these are the first bits around mindset. We're going to move on to the next one in about five minutes, but I want to pass over to you guys who are sitting there very, very um, uh, quietly at the moment because you're on mute and I'd love you to take your mutes off and I'd love to hear from you guys and get you talking about some experiences around this and how the mindset has helped you in the past year and what it's allowed you to do moving forward. So, um, Sean, why, why don't we start with you um, around mindset? What, what's your experience? What have you learned? What, what would you share? Well, I've, I've been working in the travel industry for the last um, for the last six, seven months now, um, probably a little bit longer than that. And as you probably know, it's one of the most difficult um, industries to be in at the moment. Um, I've had to be very resilient and had to have a very strong mindset um, over that period, more than more so than I had uh, had to be uh, in my whole sales career. Yeah. Um, with destinations, we had to shift the show from a, a live event to a, a, a a virtual event in quite a short space of time. Um, but the thing that's helped me um, to be optimistic in that time and to be resilient is the research piece that we did at the beginning of that process. Um, because what, what we were able to do is share the research from our visitors' uh, feedback and from, um, from the exhibitors' feedback to instill the confidence into our, our clients that a virtual event would work for them. Um, and also that instilled confidence into the team to be able to sell the show, um, to deliver a, a show that would um, deliver all the, um, what, what, with what the client needed to achieve, which was to obviously sell um, holidays um, or either and gain some research or insight into the, the industry moving forward. So with the research piece that we did at the beginning, um, we were able to instill that confidence into the team and into the uh, exhibitors and the um, and the visitors that this platform would work for them. Now, looking at it um, after the fact, we split across two date lines. The first one worked quite well because it's all about research. The second one was more commercially driven. It didn't work so well. Um, but what we learned from it is um, we had some insight into the buying cycles. We had some insight into the uh, the client's mindset over um, the next 12 months, the short term. Um, and just for the team as well, really, um, we learned a lot about the, the industry, um, of how they're thinking and, and what their plans were for the next 12 months. Um, and we're able to use that experience uh, moving forward uh, and develop the, the next show, if it's going to be a hybrid one, which is virtual and a live one, or whether it's just going to be a virtual event, um, uh, sorry, a live event on its own. Yeah, love it. Okay, so, so the kind of key learning there is around the importance of research to really cement the ability to be optimistic and the ability to really drive client belief and and your belief that something's going to work because there's some real rigor behind it. Yeah, 100%. And I think that's something that I'm going to reiterate um, on my next couple of points, really, because I think it's really, really important. Okay, love it. Okay, Sean, thank you very much. Uh, keep jumping in if there's more to add as we go through. Uh, Wella, what's your experience around this one in my, terms of mindset? Yes. Um, well, having worked with read exhibitions for the last 12 years, I've always been used to selling, you know, space uh, in-person events. So when, when uh, the pandemic happened and not having a show for the last 18 months and finally being told that we would definitely be running a live event, um, the whole mindset has changed because our offering was going to be different. We were just not selling space, but with the whole density rules, the badge restriction and, and offering a hybrid event, it was kind of like um, take, having to take a step back and um, thinking, how can, can I offer this to my client? I'm charging them for the same rates um, that we normally would pre-pandemic and um, we are restricting them from badges and the number of audience will not be the same as in 2019. So that was the kind of, of challenge that we were facing before we were going out to sell to our clients. So what we did as a group was that we conducted role plays um, to make ourselves comfortable, to understand how the calculations work in our minds when we were doing a presentation to make our clients comfortable that, okay, if this is how you're gonna be positioning yourself at the event with this stand size, this is the number of um, exhibitor badges you can only take. And this is the number of visitors at a maximum time that you can accommodate. Yeah. So of course, for us as a salesperson, 
Um, it was very uncomfortable at first, um, but the moment we started to, to speak to our colleagues and did a role play and, and trying to manage objections and trying to handle that, we kind of like eased into the process. And then when the moment we went out to our clients, we did, of course, face a lot of objections and kickback because, you know, you're charging us the same thing and um, you're giving us less of an exhibitor badges and less visitors. I mean, I mean, how can, you know, how can we make an ROI on this offering? But we did tell them that it's a hybrid event. What we're doing for you is Yes, not all of the buyers will not come to the events, but with our virtual offering happening the week after that, we can make sure that you get their audience um, that normally comes to the event through the virtual offering. So that um, kind of like made them understand that, okay, it's going to be different this year. It will be limited, but we do have a virtual offering happening the week after the in-person event. So that kind of like worked for us in the end. And um, uh, what happened then is our show delivered about 110 um, countries, I mean, attendees from 110 countries, and our exhibitors really found our event to be safe and quality because in normal years, the ratio was 12, 12 visitors, 12 buyers per one exhibiting company. Yeah. This year, we were able to deliver 11 um, exhibitor, I mean, 11 visitors and buyers per one exhibiting company. So that kind of like, you know, putting it in perspective there they were still getting the ratio as they were in normal years, close to it anyway. Uh, I love I love both of those examples. And um, well, well, just to touch on your one there, I think there's so many different elements on this screen that you kind of covered there, because one of them is kind of that resilience piece by doing the role plays and getting people, I suppose, to a degree, shifting perspective, but kind of getting used to that new habit of kind of going through this slightly different process. It creates a resilience as opposed to just throwing the salespeople straight in and saying, give it a go. Um, actually, there is that yeah. practice piece there. Was that important, that practice slide? It was very important because uh, we were not really very, we were not convinced at first, I yeah. mean, naturally. I and mean, we were selling the same package, um, but with lesser badges and lesser audience that we will bring into our exhibitors. It's a hybrid event, yeah. So we needed to instill in our minds that, you know, the mindset is different this year. It's not going to be the same as other years where it's just space, where there's going to be bountiful of people coming into the, into the show about more targeted approach, more targeted buyers. And, you know, and, and that's what we were imparting to our um, clients in the end. And, and, and they understood that. Right. Um, so that some brilliant examples there. I'm very aware of time. We've got five areas to get to. Jordana, I'm going to come to you in a second, but I'm actually going to jump to the next one if you're cool with that and see if you've got some thoughts on the next one. So... The second part of the benchmark is all around shifting perspective. And actually, uh, Wally, you just kind of touched upon it there a little bit with the role play example. Uh, and to a degree, I suppose, Sean, uh, with your example of the research, there's a shift in perspective there to a degree by working out what the other people in the party kind of need and what's going to work and what's not going to work. But in terms of the diagnostic that we're working on with the AEO, there's three core areas that we look at here. And I'd love to hear your experiences in a second around these. So shift perspective. Number one is the ability as a salesperson to truly put yourself into a client's shoes. We always bang on about it at Flume, but it's the truism of sales, which is the only reason you should do anything is to make it as easy as possible for the client to buy. So looking from the client's perspective and working out what's going to make it tough, what's going to make it easy is always going to be the best approach for them to drive the results you need. So truly being able to put yourself into the client's shoes. Second one. And Sean, uh, you, you touched upon the fact you might talk about some similar areas, uh, which I'm, I'm kind of guessing might be similar to this. But this idea of actually teaching around audience behavior and client best practice. So the reason this is here is, again, the research always shouts about the most important thing clients want from salespeople being teaching. They want to learn new ideas and perspectives, new ways to think about solving their challenges. And they need compelling reasons to do something new. The only reasons a client should do anything, if you think about it, is if it's going to make it easier for the audience to behave how they need to. Therefore, shifting the client into the audience's shoes is really important. But also if they know that other people have gone through that and it's worked for them. So shifting them to other clients' perspectives is really crucial as well. So that's what we mean by teaching around audience behavior and client best practice. 
And then the final one is Taylor's every sales experience. So there's tons of stats. I won't go through them all now, but about the importance of tailoring your conversation to the person in their role, but also to them as a person. Um, doesn't mean just being a relationship builder, but actually talking about what you can do for them within their role, what results and challenges you're going to drive and solve. So truly bespoking your conversation to them every single time is crucial. So Jordana, I promise I'll come to you. Sorry for keeping you quiet for so long, but this idea of shifting perspective um, what, what's your experience been over the past year or so and, and what sort of lessons have you learned? I think it's interesting. I think um, um, forever, forever um, and whenever I'm selling anything, I think that's that's so important for me to listen to the client and put myself in their shoes to work out what I'm going to sell them. Um, but I think over the last year, I think we've had to really do that. Now, my hand was kind of forced because we changed um, our, our largest exhibition housing. We, we made that a virtual event, we had to. So for me, it was new to me and a new, uh, new to all of my clients. So I had to, and the, the best way for me to understand that was to um, speak to the people to, that, that were sold the platform to us and, and um, the platform itself and learn that as an exhibitor and what I would gain from being an exhibitor That's of that platform. Um, and then that would be my, sales pitch so I could then demo the platform and um and I actually ended up demoing it to sales teams once clients were booked onto the event um and it was kind of a this is what I would do if I were you and if I were in your team um and it was brilliant it really worked and it really helped me and I think I now do that more than ever and I'm um I'm listening, really listening and, and speaking to each client um, about their needs. And I know it's such a basic thing that everybody should do. And like you said, it's really important, but I think we're really learning to do that, um, even, even moving back into live events. Um, I also think it's important now more than ever because of that, we've got to have empathy for our clients and really listen to them. We don't know what people are going through and it's, um, it's a strange time. So yeah, it's important to listen. I, I, I think that's such an important lesson, which is, if I kind of rephrase it slightly, is, is that what you did and what you kind of almost, you said your fat hand was false, but you moved to how do you make our proposition work for you by kind of teaching them how to use, in that case, the platform. But actually the idea of de-risking that process, the idea of actually helping your client get the most out of whatever solution they're buying from you is as critical now as it was over the last year, right? So um, I, I love the fact that that's kind of, still coming into your approach now is helping them get the most out of what they do with you and teaching them around that yeah. great so let's um let, who else has got stuff to say around the shift perspective what about you sean yeah i as, I'm, I'm a big believer in um uh in understanding um and seeing things from uh, you know the other person's point of view um and i think i've had to do this a lot over the last um, six months over my, over over the, over the period really, um, and when we're in a situation when we're talking about DNI, that's something that's really important across um, all walks of life. But bringing it back to the point, um, I think that you know listening to people and understanding them is 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 the key. Um, everyone wants to go on holiday. I work in the travel industry, so we're probably all going through the similar feelings and thoughts in terms of that. Um, but again, the research piece that we did uh, at the beginning of the process really helped us to um, shift the perspective um, in terms of the, bringing on clients to the platform. Yeah. Um, and I think um, the more that we can, we can do this uh, in terms of researching and putting yourself in, in the other person's shoes, I think um, the, the better results that we will get moving forward um, because I think it's really, really important to do that. Absolutely. And, and, and I think a, a nice way to kind of sum this up is that the job of the salesperson is to shift so the client's perspective and work out how do I best need to deliver this sales experience to make it easy for them to buy. But yeah. actually the job of the marketer or the buyer, the client, what they need to do is shift perspective to the audience, right? And work yeah. out how do they make it easy for the audience to engage. So if you can be that conduit, that kind of, I don't want to sound patronizing to the client, but teaches them that that's how they should be looking about things. That's going to really help. Jo Jordana, you're, you're nodding there. I hate to put you on the spot, but have you got any kind of views on that? It's interesting. Um, and I think even as event organisers, I think we need to shift our perspective to the audience, of course. Um, so, so for us as a business, Ocean Media looked at what um, where a lot of our spend was coming from last year because it's a strange time and the sector has changed slightly and certain companies have thrived, certain companies haven't. Um, we've actually launched a couple of products off the back of that um, by listening to our audience. Nice.
Nice. So let's pause there on this one. I think we could go on for a while on that, but I'm going to move to the third area and get you guys chatting about this. So we've looked at two areas so far, one being mindset, two being uh, shifting perspective to both the audience and the clients. Uh, three is about taking control. So let me just take you through what we mean by this. Remember, guys and girls, as you're watching this, uh, there's 53 of you who are... Um, hopefully avidly watching and taking notes as we go through. But I would recommend be brave, Q&A, put your stuff in there and we can make sure that we can answer any questions at the end. So just a reminder, start having to think about yourself and what questions you want these guys to answer. So part three, take control. Right, so this came out really strongly in some of the webinars we did uh, at Flume about a year ago where we looked <clears> at it from the buyer's perspective and again and again and again, the buyers were saying, look, it's risky for us to buy anything, uh, whether it's virtual or whether it's live, because we don't know that it's going to work. We don't know that the audience are going to engage how we need to. We don't know we're going to get ROI. And when you look at the research, it's 80% of the impact on ROI from buying a media or an event solution is down to what the client does themselves. Only 20% is down to what you sell, which is back to Jordana's point before, helping them make it work. We were hearing it again and again and again. They want help from the sales professional, but also the event business to de-risk the process. And that doesn't mean just not paying until it goes ahead or anything like that. What we're talking about here is creating toolkits to help that client to do what the audience need um, and to provide the right solution that's going to drive ROI. The next one is around being assertive. So this probably sounds quite obvious, but actually a lot of salespeople kind of move into either a passive or aggressive place when things get tough and we either are so focused on our targets we start demanding stuff from clients or we go into the passive side because we can see their side of things too much so being assertive and having a stance and being able to say this is why you should do stuff and taking the lead across the whole of the buying cycle is really crucial and the last bit but it's so important is that salespeople have a stance they know why linked to being assertive why they're doing what they're doing my belief is the only reason a salesperson should tell a client what to do is if it's going to have the biggest impact on the audience. And so having a stance, which is my job, is to make it work for you, Mr. or Mrs. Client, by putting you into the shoes and teaching you what the audience need from you is a blooming good stance to have. So whether that is your stance or not, having a stance and a rationale and context behind what you do is crucial. So... Um, Sean, your thoughts on this, but uh, Weller and Jordana, I'd love to hear uh, any, any thoughts from you as well. So I don't know who wants to start. Um, over I to can you. Go. I can go. Um, I think with the travel industry, um, the first point that you made was de-risking um, in the buying process. And that is, that's going to be key. Um, budgets are very, very low at the moment and probably, uh, you know, at a point where every the, the buying process in terms of the number of people involved is going to be a, a lot a lot bigger. There's probably going to be from um, six, probably up to nine people, if not just directly with the CEO, not just the marketing involved in, in that process. Yeah. Um, so, to, you know, it, it goes back to the research piece. And um, by using that research piece to demonstrate that you understand the audience's buying process, it puts you in a position of thought leadership. It then puts the client in a position of thought leadership. And um, as I said before, we split the show across two, the de destination show across two uh, datelines. The first one was all about um, uh, um, installing confidence into um, the visitors from, from the, the, the exhibitor's point of view. Um, and without that research piece, we would have not been able to install that confidence into the exhibitors and made them believe that the platform would, would work for them. Um, and I had to be assertive in, in, in doing this um, because that, we had no choice. Um, we have to, we have targets to hit, which is whatever, but also the client has targets to hit. So it then goes back to um, putting yourself in the client's um, um, shoes. Um, and then it's all about being proactive and just making sure you speak to as many people um, as possible um, and making sure they, they understand the benefits, what it is that you're trying to deliver um, putting them in, in a position of power where they can um, speak to the, um, the audience, if you like, uh, our, our visitors, um, and achieve their goals, which is achieving their ROIs from the show and making sure that the, the level of investment for them is also at a level which um, is not too risky because normally at a live show, maybe they'll spend 30K 
um, at, in this instance, there were, we was asking for a thousand pounds, but in, in this circumstance, a thousand pounds can still be a lot of money. Um, so again, the research piece, understanding the uh, industry, making them understand that they have um, uh, they have power to um, uh, to guide the audience in terms of the uh, uh, visitors on the platform to what they can um, that they can be, have reassurance that coming to them to buy a holiday um, is not going to be too risky for the for the visitors as well um, is really important. So um, I think it's a combination of of all the different elements from my side, from the uh, exhibitor side, and from the um, and from the visitor side to make sure that everyone um, feels confident and everyone feels a little bit of control in each different element of of the sales process. Love it. Um, I, I, I've got something I want to add in a sec, but just just uh, well well on Jordana before I do. Anything you want to add on this one? Not really. I completely agree with what Sean said. Uh, said, and I think. Um, it's also that focusing on what Weller said earlier about the, the quality of the audience. Our audiences might not be as big as they previously were and things like that, but we've really got, I think, um, particularly with my events, but um, I assume a lot of events will have a really good quality audience. And I think that's what our buyers want. Um, so it's instilling that as well and taking control and really controlling that conversation. I love that point. And again, that came out in some of the research we did when we were doing our webinars over the last year. But actually, clients aren't necessarily looking for massive numbers. They're looking for the outcome from it, which might be one deal, right? So the natural thing for a lot of salespeople is they go, oh my goodness, it's only got 50 people who are coming to this. But if they're 50 good people who are in a position where they might buy and actually there's a decent... Uh, size of order value then I mean that is amazing for a client it's more likely they're going to get ROI off the back of it so repositioning a little bit the, the other bits I just wanted to add very quickly before we move on to the next one is that working with a number of events companies at Flume Sales Training we're seeing a number of them going down this de-risk in the buying process by building toolkits which are designed to get clients into the head of the audience so they don't just sell the event and leave they actually say we've got mechanisms to help you build the right messaging for your audience we've got mechanisms to make sure you're preparing and delivering and following up in the right way for the audience we they build their packages out of what works for the audience so that it instills confidence in the client because ultimately the biggest why should a marketer do anything or a client do anything is to drive the right behavior from the audience so they really put that at the focus of everything so let's move on to the fourth one, collaborate. Okay, uh, quite an overused term, but uh, my, my take on collaboration is you cannot truly collaborate, and Sean summed this up really well just now, you can't truly collaborate unless you're focused on what you're, unless both parties are focused on the same thing, right? But actually, more and more, salespeople are so focused on driving the results they need that actually it often drives the wrong approach with the client. The client needs to believe that you are there to drive, as Sean said, their results get hit their targets because if you help them get there they're going to get you to where you need to be a lot quicker so the three areas are focus on client goals um uh, and works as a trusted advisor so it puts trust at the heart of everything they're doing and jordana you used this phrase earlier which i love which is kind of if i was you if I was in your shoes, this is what I'd genuinely be doing and kind of seeing themselves as an extension of that marketing department. Co-creating solutions. Uh, if you've been on any webinar ever of mine, you would have heard me say this before, but it's 10 times more likely a client will buy off you if they've been involved in co-creating the solution. And co-creating a solution, how do you do it? You put the client in the audience's shoes and work out where the audience is starting and where they need to get them to and what's going to work for them. So being able to create stuff that's going to drive the client ROI because it informs uh, influences the audience behavior in a right way is crucial and the last one here is actively listens to truly understand needs so it's not about diagnosing needs and actually there's some research on this from the rain group that said that out of a list of 42 things that salespeople do based on what's most influential for clients and why they chose one salesperson over another being able to diagnose needs i think was 37th on the list i.e a salesperson being able to diagnose a client's needs this client didn't find that useful but actually, number, I think it's four or five, was understand my real needs and help me understand my real needs. There's a big difference between diagnose and understand, because if you diagnose, you're saying, what do you need to achieve? But if you're understanding, you're asking why and where do you actually need to be? And is that actually what the audience need you to achieve? And you're helping them understand their real needs so that they can move forward in the right way. 
So collaboration. Let's hear from you guys. So um, let's come to um, Wella. How about yourself? Sorry, I haven't asked you a question for a little while. So let's hear from you. Yeah, no problem. Well, um, when we were pitching to our clients, um, it was important for us to, to make them understand and inculcate in their mind that this show is really going to be different um, because they will not be getting, the, again, I go back to restrictions. I'm always going back to that because it's a live event that we did um, last month and how different it was from the previous years. So when we were talking with our clients, there's always a lot of consultation and, and really understanding, okay, this is the event that you will be exhibiting after 18 months of not having a travel and tourism events. Um, what are you looking at achieving by coming to this event? Why are you exhibiting um, when your other, when your other um, competitors are not exhibiting? Why is it important for you? What do you want to get out of? You know, give us a measurement of, of your expectation. For example, I want to get this many buyers. And I also have co-exhibitors, for example, this client is saying, and I want my co-exhibitors to also be having this many meetings on site. So when we started having that conversation with them um, and really drilling down into finding out um, why they wanted to be an event, considering that there's travel restrictions, considering that they may go into a lockdown and, you know, will be investing into a show that they may not necessarily travel. So it, it's really understanding why is it so important for them to be at the show. And, and once you understood that, it was then coming up to them with the solutions that we offered based on the different um, product offering that we had for this year. And um, because of that consultation um, that we did with our clients, we uh, found out that a lot of their decisions were driven by the suggestions that we were offering to them. Like for example, okay, this is my budget, but this is how many I want to be able to uh, cater on my stand. And I have this many co-exhibitors, um, but this is just my budget. And then going back to them and saying, actually with this budget, this is how much you can accommodate. This is the size that you can get. And this is how many partners that you can only have. So the clients, you know, it's almost like going to a virtual blackboard and, and going through the numbers with them, doing some calculations and then them understanding, okay, th this is not going to work. And then them having an internal discussion and coming back to us and saying, you know what, I think this event is really important for us. So we're going to go double the size that we had in 2019. And I think that has been a big win because that, that wasn't just a discussion that happened in one phone call. It was, you know, thorough collaboration and, and just really consulting with the clients until understanding that um, just really matching the benefit. I mean, giving them the benefit rather than the features of, of the event itself. I think that's what really worked. Um, were there other departments just than sales from uh, Reed involved in those conversations too? Absolutely. I mean, that was the great thing about uh, with this event, because in, in my 12 years, this is the first time I've experienced working with operations, you know, understanding the whole density with marketing, how we can um, convince our uh, exhibitors that we're bringing them the right buyers, the right exposure to the event, and of course, driven by our, our director. And we knew that we had a plan, you know, this was the plan, this is what we're going to, and this is the direction. And it was just a matter of us all coming together and, and making it all happen with, with everyone's efforts, um, making sure that we translate that to our clients so that they get the confidence that, okay, you know what, this show could be the show for us. We could get something out of it, considering it may not be the same, but yeah. So that was really a great um, collaboration with, with the rest of the team. As well. I, I love that example. And, and also what you've done there is you've brought some science or maths or equations almost into it, which prove again and put that confidence back in because it's kind of like, okay, if you need this many people and this many conversations, then you're going to have to do it in this way. And I think there's a massive lesson to be learned there that is kind of best practice for anyone selling uh, events or virtual which is work out what is the outcome the client wants and actually what needs to happen in terms of working with you to get them there and using almost that maths to get them to realize a the impact but b what they need to choose and buy to get there i love that um, let's um, come over look jordana uh, how about yourself what's your experience around the collaboration side um, so I've spoken already a little bit about that listening and how important it is. So I won't um, I won't go on about that anymore. But I think the co-creating solutions is really interesting. So 
um, I'm, I'm working and I've, I've worked with a client and um, they've never spent with us before and they are, um, they're booked into my event homes in November. And um, there was a lot of back and forward between getting their package all, all, all sorted and agreed and we worked together on what they're going to do. They've never done anything before. They've actually um, ended up being our biggest spender so far for the event, which is brilliant. But it didn't end there. So now what we're doing is they're so invested in the event um, and wanting the event to do well, obviously for themselves as well, but they want the event to go well, it'd be great for them, um, that we're actually holding an open day together to get more suppliers and more clients on board. Um, nice. And they're doing, we're kind of working in partnership with that. So it's really, um, yeah, really interesting that you, you say about that. What, what, what do you think you guys did, Jordana, um, at Ocean uh, Media Group to kind of encourage that, especially from a client who's never worked with you before, right? That's quite a, quite a cool outcome. So what, what did it, was it just by chance or did you put stuff in place to make sure that collaboration was high with that client? I've been working on this client for a, a good year or so, so <laughs> it wasn't by chance. But um, we worked with um, a couple of their competitors, and I think it was a matter of time, but it wasn't necessarily going to be. They, they were looking at something like a four by two meter stand, which we all know is great, but it's not a massive presence at an event. And they're now um, they're now taking a, a huge presence. So it was just that collaboration. We we had numerous teams calls. We worked together with um, their MD, their marketing, their, um, their their supplier comms team. Um, and we just, just worked together on a package that they're now really happy with. They're so invested in the event, like I said, and, and um, they want to help me now, which is brilliant. I love it. That's yeah. so great. Love that example. So um, let's come to the last one uh, and then we will um, see if there's any questions. Um, we had some submitted actually uh, prior to the session. So um, we'll look at those as well. So the fifth area on the benchmark is around projecting confidence, which the whole thing is really. But what we mean by this is um, if you're someone who is a salesperson is projecting confidence, then it's very likely that the person you're speaking to is going to feel more confident themselves. It ties into a little bit the uh, mindset piece around optimism, but this is around kind of really delivering your message in a way that uh, helps your client feel confident and you have ways set up to make that happen. So number one, it's again, quite an overused word. There's a brilliant book for anyone who's a bit of a geek like me who wants to uh, find out about charisma, but it's called the charisma myth. And it kind of talks about how do you project charisma? But one of the great things with charisma is it drives trust and there's different types of charisma. So being able to be someone who in encourages enthusiasm and belief from a client, putting yourself across and delivering your conversation and your messages in the right way is absolutely crucial. Number two, um, creates a standout remote and virtual experience. We've actually just created a, um, a benchmark around this and a set of courses around this because a massive area, when you look into what clients are saying, I think it's something like 85% of B2B clients say that they're not looking to move away from the, the, the remote sales experience. So kind of getting used to this and being able to deliver um, a virtual conversation and a virtual relationship in a different way that we're used to is, is really crucial because you have one chance often to make the right impression and you don't have some of the benefits you had face to face to build that relationship with clients. So making sure you're delivering standout experiences is crucial and plan best in class experiences. So what we mean by that is looking at every single intervention with a client as crucial and really important because we need to make sure that every single conversation we're having with a client takes that client on the right journey, that we've planned for it in the right way and we're getting as far as we can in each conversation as possible. One of the things a lot of salespeople, including me in the past, has not been super great at is planning for the sales conversations or the sales emails because we think, hey, we've been doing it for years, we can just do it. But actually putting yourself into the client's shoes, working out where you want to get into by the end of it, where they are at the start of the conversation or the email, and then creating an email that works for them is absolutely crucial. A bit of planning makes a massive difference to the confidence you can instill in clients, but also yourself. So let's come over to you guys. Um, Wella, what's your experience around um, these areas, this projecting confidence? Well, um, I want to know that we did face a lot of challenges leading up to our event. Um, we had the skeptics from all walks of life. Like, are you sure you're having a live event? Is it the right time? And are we going to get the ROI? All of this um, objections that we were getting. Um, and of course, the, the questions of how is it going to look like? How can you safely, um, you know, assure us about the event? All, all these things. So what we did collaboratively, it's going back to collaboration, but also about projecting confidence, was we as a group 
um, um, offered exhibitor workshops, both in person and virtual um, exhibitor workshops. So that involved everyone in the team, down from our director, from our marketing, our operations, um, to cover all the areas um, relevant to each department to get to get that um, confidence to our exhibitors, like letting them know, okay, this is what's happening with ATM this year and in our event. Um, these are the changes and uh, assuring them that we have been working closely with the relevant authorities and we're actively listening to industry, knows what's going on around, and um, assuring them that we feel this is the right time. We are in the travel and tourism industry, which is what our event caters to. And that's why it's very important to have your support and looking at them in the eye, you know, really like this event is for you. We are the platform for you to have business again. Yeah. So, um, all these changes we're doing for you, um, all these um, regulations in place. I know it's challenging to, to build your stand or to start your preparation, but we are here, all the support that you need. So um, we always made sure that we were available as a team whenever they, they needed some, you know, some questions and doubts some guidance. It, it was really everyone coming in together and um, informing our clients um, what we can do for them to make sure that they do get the ROI on the event. Um, so in, in the end, during the, those exhibitor workshops, there was a lot of interaction. With the exhibitors were starting to ask questions. And whenever they were asking questions, we could like, you know, look at them really and explain to them and, and give them that assurance that you can confidently exhibit safely. And, and have a quality event. And, and that's what we're bringing to you. And once they understood that, then the confidence started to set in. But it started, it needed to start with us as the organizers, yeah. that we were confident in being able to bring the event so that that translated into our exhibitors. Yeah, that, that's great. And that, and that idea of kind of almost doing a brainstorm yourselves, what are the questions clients are going to be asking and being able to kind of then ask answer them when necessary so brainstorming the tough questions and creating answers for those clients I imagine is, is quite a big part of that exactly great so, so um, let's uh, Sean what's your experience around this projecting confidence piece I think with projecting confidence um, it's important obviously but it, it goes at every step of the, the sales cycle so yeah. from the moment I speak with the client for the first time they may have an interaction with the marketing team. They may have an interaction with the operations team. Um, and one thing we learned from your training, actually, um, a few months ago, was that the importance of the team's coherence and making sure that the team are all working together to um, deliver a, a product or an event that is um, what the client needs. And that has to happen at every stage of the conversation. But particularly for us, we started doing demonstrations of the platform. Um, and one key thing that I learned uh, or gave, grew to understand was that I needed to um, show the client the journey from the home screen, from the moment that the visitor came onto the platform and how they got to the, the exhibitor's um, stand virtually. Um, and this was really important in, in building that confidence because once people understood how that happened, what you would find is it would help you to actually sell more products. What I mean by that is if there was an element that they thought was more important than another, it could have, you know, they could add to the package that they originally wanted. Um, so, so the confidence would just grow and grow and grow. The more that I understood how that journey worked and, and the more that they understood how that journey worked. And then obviously dealing with the marketing and dealing with the operations team, it helped them to even build that confidence even more, more so for the, for the event because they had a real um, rounded understanding of exactly what it was that they were um, receiving, yep. what it was that they could uh, produce in terms of their uh, product and how that would um, be received by the, uh, by the visitors. And it just, in, 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 all, in all aspects, in terms of, you know, we didn't have a perfect show, but at least I felt confident that they had they under, under a good understanding of what they were getting themselves into. And even if it didn't work out at the end, most of the people that did came back and said that, you know, they didn't have a great show, they understood that we had given them the best that we could and at the time that they were happy. So, you know, it, and it just goes to, back again, to the research piece. It helps us to move forward and to understand how to deliver these shows again, either next year or how the um, 
how the process will affect them in terms of the live show and how we can maybe use some of that um, information to then um, help them uh, moving forward. So, so it kind of really builds into the innovation piece from what yeah. I can hear there, kind of learning from mistakes, but also strengths and things that worked, but also the audience perspective and building new approaches for clients based on what the audience needs. Yes, 100%. Awesome. Guys, that's been so cool. So what I'm going to do, I'm just going to go to um, this final slide here and then I'm going to ask you a couple of questions, which uh, you may not be aware that I'm going to ask you. Um, so um, just to summarise to anyone who's watching, um, uh, my, my animation skills are very poor. Uh, that's summary number one, because it just did that flash in again. Uh, but there are five areas in terms of the uh, diagnostic, which you'll be sent after today from the AEO. So we've talked about all five today. One being the mindset that you're in, making sure the resilience is there, the optimism there, the growth mindset's there, the shifting perspective, putting yourself in the client's shoes and thinking what's going to make it tough for them to say yes, what's going to make it easy, but also helping the client shift to the audience's shoes and work out what the audience needs to say yes to them, and also shifting the client into other clients' perspectives and teaching them around what works and what doesn't work. Taking control, the client doesn't always know the right answers right now. So being able to lead them through, as Sean just mentioned, every stage of that decision-making process is really, really crucial. Having a stance as to why they should do something. Overall, the overwhelming thing I'm hearing today is the reason the client should do anything is if it's going to work for the audience. So the stance should be teaching and guiding the client from the audience's perspective. Collaboration. Collaboration comes from having the same goal as the person you're speaking to. So focusing on the targets they need to achieve and advising and working out ways that are going to work for them. So you can be a trusted advisor, but also you can say, if I was in your position, this is what I would do, just like Jordana mentioned before. And then projecting confidence. So making sure that we're let's go back to that one here, uh, planning those best in class experiences every single time. Focusing on charisma, making sure our energy is coming across in the right way in those client conversations and also making sure that our remote experiences are as strong as possible where we have just one chance and don't have the same ability necessarily in terms of the live interactions. So there are the five areas. This will be sent out to you after. I've got three questions. I'm going to fire one at each of you and then uh, we'll have a, a closing question and we will be done. <laughs> oh, are you ready? I'm going to start, Jordana, I'm going to start with you. These are in the chat, by the way, guys, uh, and these were submitted beforehand. I am just going to triple check whether there's any more. Yeah, okay, fine. So here we go. Jordana, are you ready? I think so. Okay, so um, this one is about the rebook. Um, we haven't really mentioned rebook that much today. So how important is a rebook element within your sales strategy now is the question. Um, it's always important. So um, no matter what event we're delivering live, virtual, for us, it's a massive part of the sales strategy. It has to be, it gets you off to a good start for the following event. Um, and, and like Sean mentioned earlier as well, he said something about at the time they are happy. And normally at events, even if they're having a bad time, it's not because of something we've done and these things happen, but we have to strike while the iron's hot. So I think, yeah, rebook will always be important no matter what we're doing. Okay, great. And on that rebook piece, I totally agree with you. Um, I, I would say that one of the big learnings we've had over the, uh, well, not just the past year, but that we kind of preach about quite a lot is to have that as your focus. You want the client to be a find it easy to buy more and say yes more next time. And that all comes down to all of the stuff we've talked about today, putting yourself in their shoes, thinking what's going to drive ROI, creating approaches that work for the audience and them, and making sure you're delivering best-in-class events that work for the audience client and therefore you and therefore they'll be rebooking let's go to the next one so i'm going to throw this one at wella so um how do you overcome um i'm uh, okay so i've just i'm reading it um okay so how do you overcome the objection of their fear of going into lockdown well um Nowadays, uh, that's really something that's not in our control. We know that. I mean, when, when a destination goes into lockdown and you're not able to travel, there's pretty much nothing that we can do when that happens. Um, I think the good thing right now with, with us as the organizers is our offering has shifted from, from just obviously in person, but we do have the virtual element as well. And whenever, because we did get 
those kind of questions from our exhibitors, like what happens if I'm not able to travel? So we did then highlight on the virtual elements in which we are bringing the buyers to you. You may not be able to travel, but with our platform, you will still be able to meet with the buyers so that when you get out of the lockdown, you can then carry on and do your business. But it's important to, to continue with the connection um, and the communication with the prospects and, and the business of, of, of potential business with these buyers through this ATM, uh, through this virtual platform that we have. So I think it's just, emphasizing on the benefit of a virtual, um, which is a, a, in worst case scenario, we can do at the moment. Yeah, and, and, and actually the way, the way that I often think about that, and I think you've summed that up really well, is that actually, although it's worst case uh, example, kind of if, if, it, if lockdown happens and you can't deliver the event, actually the audience are looking for the best opportunity to engage. And if the best opportunity when they can't go in lockdown is to engage virtually, then this, the audience is still looking to do the same thing, which is make decisions and find suppliers. And so you need to go where the audience are going at that time, wherever that is, whether it's in person or whether it's virtual. Um, let's come to... Um, Sean, um, this one here is in a time, oh, it sounds like the start of a film, in uh -huh. a time of the unknown, how do you provide confidence in areas that can be subject to change, but what, want them to still book now? So I'll just read that again. In a time of the unknown, how do you provide confidence in areas that can be subject to change, but want them to still book now? So it's kind of about urgency, I suppose. How do you get them to focus on doing it now as opposed to waiting? Yeah, well, I think um, if... if it goes back again to the research piece um, because all you can do is deliver statistics and, and facts from, from the research piece. Um, and, you know, if you can deliver it again, deliver that with confidence um, and give them that understanding, then it, they're going to be more likely to, to go with you. Um, at the end of the day, um, you know, virtual events um, are, you know, some people like them, some people don't. But I think if you can deliver statistics and facts from, um, from maybe the uh, visitor's point of view, if you want to say from a virtual point of view, that this is that people are wanting to engage with them right now. And if you don't um, engage with them or you go missing and you're not involved with um, this event at this particular moment, then they're, they're, they're likely to go to someone else is, is normally enough to give them a little push over the line and, um, and, and get them on, on, on your side and, um, and get them involved. Love it. Um, we've just got one more question which has just come in. Um, we, we have to keep this really quick. Uh, you guys uh, don't know about this one unless you've just read it at the same time as me. So this is from anonymous attendee. Um, so during uncertain times, how do you de-risk the buying process and guarantee ROI to clients? Anyone got any views on that? How have you guys tried to de-risk the buying process and whether you can guarantee or do everything you can to guarantee ROI for clients? A any examples from you guys? It, it depends what ROI they, they're looking for, I guess. Um, um, there is no guarantee in terms of ROI, but at the end of the day, I, I'll keep banging on about it. The research is, is key. Understanding the industry is key. But I don't want to take all the lamb. I know Jordani is just trying to say something as well, so uh, you can jump in. Um, I think for me, it goes back to just making sure that we're, we're listening to our clients. And if you understand what they need to do, then you're kind of de-risking that buying process. You're, you're selling them what's right for them. Um, yeah. And um, like Sean said, we can't guarantee an ROI, but our audience is very much the same over a virtual event or a live event, and they're still buying into that same audience. So that should kind of de-risk itself. Yeah, yeah, ab absolutely. I, I remember one of the things I learned a, a long uh, time ago on a very good training course, actually, but it wasn't by us, it was by someone else. <laughs> uh, we're talking about the difference between ROI and ROO uh, and, and focusing on return on objective and being able to try and guarantee that is a lot easier than the ROI bit because the ROI bit is down to time scales in terms of how quickly and long the audience take to buy from the client, but also how good they are at selling all of those different pieces. So the best you can do is try and, as Sean said before, make that as easy for them as possible. But guaranteeing the ROI is a tough one if the ROI means they have to have sold something. So it is around that clarification of exactly what are the goals that you can help them get to and what do they have to kind of own themselves and potentially creating toolkits to help them yeah. do it better i guess i guess royal sorry to interrupt it's, it's about um finding out um what do they need to do to achieve those targets like for me i always ask people in the virtual event how many people do you need to see for you to be able to convert because then it puts the question back onto them about yeah. what they need to do to to, to to achieve that number and it's just not about what you um can deliver it's a it's a bit of a combination of the two 
Yeah, 100%. And back to Weller's point, as a final comment from me, you could turn that into an equation, which is that how many, how much is the average order size? How mm. many people do you need to speak to to convert one of them? Right, okay. So you're saying if we can get that many people in front of you that you have conversations with, then this many will likely convert and that's the amount of money it's going to make you. That helps a client to use the maths to kind of work out the logic behind what they should be paying you and why it's valuable. So I'm going to pause it there. Um, <laughs> my animation skills are so bad. Look, there we go. Uh, right. So um, these are the next two sessions, ladies and gents. So uh, we have a session in uh, a month time on the 13th of July and also a third session named the Events Businesses. The one in a month is aimed at sales leaders, but everyone can attend. Um, and we're going to be looking at a benchmark around each of those areas. I want to say a massive thank you to Sean Stewart, from Clarion Weller from Reed Exhibitions and also Jordana from um, Ocean Media Group. You guys have been awesome and um, given so many ideas. And I hope everyone who's listening here has been able to take some stuff on and will be able to use some of these insights to put into practice yourselves and drive confidence back into your clients and the audience, but also start driving your revenues. So ladies and gents who are watching, it's been a pleasure. Sean Weller, Jordana and the AEO, thank you very much for trusting us as your uh, sales ambassadors. Um, we'll see you again soon. Stay well.